All right. The war was over, and now we have the 1920s. This section specifically talks about the 20s. 1920, a couple years in 1930. But it's pretty easy, as far as time is concerned, to um, cover this section. America's going to take off. That's what's called the Roaring Twenties. There's going to be celebrations, partying, and economy. America's not going to be that bad. Um, first, there is kind of technically a slight little recession. Um, and that, tip, that is actually pretty typical after a uh, huge war ends. One, now in this case, you have two million soldiers came home looking for jobs. So you have a lot of unemployed people. Wartime factories closed. Right, which means less jobs. Farmers lost this European market. Remember, when Great Britain, France, or all, all their men are all fighting, they need food to support the war. The citizens need food, um, and they actually exported or uh, they imported for them uh, tons of grain, wheat, and food from America. But now the war is over. They're not going to buy from America anymore, and those farmers actually lost their European customers. And so we actually have a slight recession from 1909 to 1921, but it's very slight, almost a dip. A few people realize it. Now, all honestly, if you look into history, the farmers don't really recover near that fast like the rest of the economy. They do suffer for quite a bit. But nonetheless, uh, the president who is elected in 1920 is uh, Warren G. Harding. Harding is going to be elected president on its one specific campaign policy, a return to normalcy. And just like it sounds, he wanted things to go back to normal. This is post-War One, and most Americans felt like World War One was a waste um, of American lives, time, money. Um, it was a poor choice to get involved. Um, we'll come back from it and decide it didn't change anything. Um, and Americans elect him on this policy, this idea, let's go back to the way things were before, normal before this great war. Um, and in doing so, they actually even take it to the extreme and go back to a level of isolationism and that we're not going to look at the rest of the world. Whatever issues you guys have, y'all can deal with it. Um, this is pretty much going to be our policy throughout the 1920s when it comes to regards to foreign issues. Um, there, there is a couple of small exceptions, which we actually um, get to here in a little bit. But Warren G. Harding will be our president. This whole policy put America first. Sound familiar? A lot of presidents repeat that old say so. Um, but return to normalcy is often the most asked about version of this guy's uh, campaign promise. Um, uh, but nonetheless, he is elected in 1920, which you know, according to the zero curse, he must die um, while in office in which he will die in office. But we'll get to that um, later. All right. One thing that also does happen that's worth noting is the Red Scare in the United States. Um, even now, you, it's, it's kind of hilarious how Americans o always uh, try to drive this fear of communism, or in this case, socialism in modern times. Um, it's always been an argument from one political side. Um, but even back then, there was a serious Red Scare. And this actually happens a couple of times. First time is here after World War One. Second time is actually after World War Two. But this first time in, after World War One, it actually came a lot about after Russia, um, a powerful European country, with a dynasty, a monarchy, royalty, and everything, um, had a communist revolution of their own in 1917, and they left World War One. If you guys remember, we talked about that. America had a deep fear of communism itself ever since the 1920s, um, and this fear and this overreaction uh, would be nicknamed the Red Scare. And you just see from these uh, cartoons um, how much people took it. There's an American flag here. Um, there's a guy from Russia. Bolshevism, which is the version of communism that went out in Russia, and he's bringing a torch or a fire with him called anarchy, right? That was seen all often. This was a big one that leads to, um, explains why socialism and labor get such a bad rap nowadays. Um, if labor or workers go on strikes and have walkouts, the next step is riots and disorder. The next step is Bolshevism and murders, and then there's chaos in America. It's it's a fear tactic that they use. Uh, we've seen this before throughout uh, U.S. history, world history in general. Um, Hitler's using the same thing when he takes power and he convinces people he's the only one that can stop the communists. Much like politicians now, America convinces everybody they're the only ones that can stop the socialists from taking over. Um, and this one is actually 
unfair of me. I, I use this cartoon. It's actually from World War II in the second Red Scare. But nonetheless, it's the same idea. It says what's going to happen tomorrow in America um, if the communists capture us. This Red Scare actually had some legitimate cause behind it because there were anarchists um, in America, um, and they were doing some pretty bad stuff. Um, after one point, after 30 bombings that took place, um, including eight cities in one day, um, one of those was actually at Attorney General uh, Mitchell Palmer's house, um, and they're at federal buildings, other people's houses, um, judges, lawyers, all kinds of people had uh, bombs into their house. Um, many of them did blow up. Attorney General, who is like the lawyer for the president administration, you could say, um, and has a lot of power law say so about how law laws to go about. He um is targeted um, in one of these bombs by some of these anarchists, um, and he's going to um, convince uh, FBI to um, start these raids. They're going to be nicknamed the Palmer Raids, and these Palmer Raids um, essentially was the Attorney General rounded up 4,000 suspects. No warrants, nothing like that. Round them up. Um, most of them were uh, immigrants. Rounds them up, and... Um, uh, does release some of them, but for the most part, since many to jail and deport 600 of them with no warrants, nothing at all, and essentially just like you think that's breaking your rights, and it did. Um, but people didn't stop them. Um, at that point in time, there was little um, resistance to this. And given the fact that people were scared, like these bombings were happening and people were dying, um, and literally across eight large cities in one single day, you had um, 30 bombs total go off. So it was a bit of Big fear at that point in time. Um, the man in charge of the FBI at the time, that's in charge of the FBI and the raids, is J. Edgar Hoover. He is a um, head of the FBI. That's not going to be Herbert Hoover, our president, but that's where Hoover gets his um, uh, place in history as. I mean, there is a movie with Leonardo DiCaprio as Herbert, uh, as Edgar Hoover, in um, charge of the FBI. Did a lot of crazy, sketchy stuff the entire time he was head of FBI, going all the way forward to um, his spying on Martin Luther King um, and other uh, figures that he accused of being um, communists. But nonetheless, at this point in time, you've got to know the Palmer Raids, what they were, and also Hoover was in charge of these. Uh, but they're called the Palmer Raids because Attorney General Palmer was the one who authorized this. So perfect example of how scared Americans were of communists um, an anarchist and the Red Scare itself was a Sacco and Vanzetti trial. Um, what happened was there was an armed robbery, and these two men arrested for the armed robbery, but there's very little evidence to tie them to it. As a matter of fact, the only evidence is the gun that was used um, to shoot and kill the guard matched a gun found in one of these gentlemen's house. Um, not the exact bullet fired. They did not trace it back to that gun. They couldn't do that back then. All they had was a bullet that was 9mm and a gun that was 9mm, and they say this could be it. But if you know anything about guns, 9mm is a very popular gun, for example. Uh, but nonetheless, that was enough to put him on trial. Um, the judge even joked about how he can't wait to try his anarchists. He hates them. Um, these guys are immigrants from, um, if you guess it, from the name, Vanzetti, um, from uh, Italy, right? So he is from Italy, so they represent what we always call a new immigrant at the time. A lot of people... Um, showed them discrimination and didn't like these new um, immigrants. And this is just a perfect example of the Red Scare, um, the sphere of communism, and how this leads to the rise of nativism um, again. Um, but uh, nonetheless, some of them are since this died. People around the world protest this. I mean, the judge was just, it was set up, it seemed like a setup from the get go. They didn't get a fair trial. They, they do appeal it. Um, but it doesn't go anywhere. Um, people around the world will, will protest this because they see it as just a, um, a joke of a trial. It wasn't real. Uh, but nonetheless, these two men, Sacco and trial, demonstrates how serious people were against uh, the fear of the Red Scare and communists. And that background leads to the rebirth of nativism. So I want to hear some stuff that might catch your um, eye right away that scares you immediately is the Ku Klux Klan, the KKK. They're reborn at this time period. You see, after um, after the Civil War and the Ku Klux Klan failed at their attempt to um, hold back and restrict African Americans um, and their rights, um, the KKK pretty much died off. 
But um, this rise in nativism at the time, which if you remember, we talked about this throughout U.S. history. Um, first, it was the Irish, and then there was these new immigrants that were targeted. Um, natives, the first immigrants that came over, looked at these new immigrants, the second generation immigrants, and disliked them. Um, for whatever reasons, either they're from South and uh, East, East Europe, and they're just different. Um, and we talked about that in detail before. But that rise in nativism is also going to be the rise of the KKK. Um, it's going to be born. KK, we actually look at them in, in history as being three steps. One, civil war. Two, here in 1920s with nativism. Um, the third level of them becomes in the civil rights era um, in the 1960s. And then I think history will, will show that uh, the rise of nativism here in the past four years in America um, will show another uh, level of white supremacy. Maybe not necessarily the KK, but definitely a rise in white supremacy. I mean, the fear of immigrants, uh, even modern times, we see a repeat in history. The three administrations we talk about in the 1920s, so Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover, and they all had the same thing in common. They were Republicans, and back then, just like Republicans now, um, they supported business 110%. So they uh, enjoyed tariffs, right? Um, they wanted people to buy American goods, American business, so they placed tariffs on other countries. And in turn, other countries put tariffs on us, and it actually slowed down the economy, which it does. As a matter of fact, we're talking about the largest tariffs in, tariff in history by this guy, uh, Hoover. Um, they also believe in lowering taxes on the wealthy corporations in the hopes that, hey, um, if the corporations pay less in taxes, they can expand their business and create jobs. That's always been a, an idea. Um, in modern times, you can argue, yes, McDonald's and Walmart can create jobs, but usually they take that money and create a job in another country. Like China has more McDonald's than the uh, United States at this point. Um, so McDonald's actually stock does better when the American dollar does worse. So that's uh, always been an argument. Um, it peaks really in the 1980s, but it starts way back here in the 1920s. And then what I have is the word lax enforcement of the Antitrust Act. So these presidents, um, they're pro-business, they're kind of going to ignore the whole idea of antitrust and, and busting up monopolies. They're not going to be for that no matter what. They're so pro-business, they kind of just leave everything out. And many Americans agree with them. They thought the government had just was just too much. After the whole progressive era and the government interfering and stepping in, people were okay with that. But at some point with World War I, people just wanted us to just, the government to just stay out of everything, it appears. Um, but this is all typical pro-business uh, resolutions that all these presidents, all these Republican presidents in the 1920s will follow. And many times we can easily argue that they, um, their policies lead to the depression of the 1930s, which we get to in a little bit. So I talked about how Harding was very pro-America first, isolationism, stay out of everything. The one thing he did do that's worth mentioning is um, the Washington Naval Conference. This was actually a conference hosted where countries, some of the biggest countries got together with the biggest navies and agreed to reduce the size of the Navy. Um, for the most part, what most of these countries end up doing, including America, we do reduce the size of our Navy, um, depending on certain battleships, submarine, and larger ocean liners. But we end up phasing out the old ones and keeping newer ones in. So um, the the world is, even Japan was part of this. Um, they did all agree to reduce our Navy. So that's the one thing we do uh, have that's a foreign issue from uh, Harding. Now Harding will be known as one of the worst presidents, not the worst, but he's definitely in the bottom 10 because he was so corrupt. Um, however, most of the stuff doesn't come out until after he's dead. Um, so his legacy now, looking back, is pretty horrible when stuff comes out. But at the time, it, it wasn't well known at all. Um, it should have been. Um, his The people he appointed were his friends from Ohio. He was from Ohio, and when he went presidency, he um, appointed his friends, and they were nicknamed the Ohio Gang. Um, and of course, when you hire friends in the cabinet to do jobs, they're not really the best at the job. They're just your buddies, right? I mean, these guys would meet together and play poker and drink. Um, weekly, if not nightly, and this is a point in time where prohibition existed, so alcohol was illegal. So you just ignored that altogether. So um, kind of gives you an idea of what was going behind the scenes. And but the scandal that's always asked about, the biggest one by far on every state test and our test will be the Teapot Dome scandal. Okay, and so essentially it's um, nothing to do with teapots at all. Um, but the Teapot Domes were these hills in Wyoming. It was, it was uh, federal lands. And this land was off limits 
to mining uh, for trees or drilling for oil. It was actually federal land. They knew the oil was there, but it was supposed to be reserved in case times of war. So the federal government not wanting to use all this oil right away, especially when we start using it more and more for our defenses and other things. The federal government said that oil is going to be there. We're going to leave it there. We're going to save it when we need it. Um, we can just keep it in the ground. We don't have to like dig it up or anything. Um, however, um, Harding Secretary of the Interior will secretly lease that land to some oil companies um, in order for a bribe. Uh, he takes a suitcase full of money, and these companies are allowed to go to that land, drill oil, and pull oil from it. Um, this ends up being called a Teapot Dome Scandal because it was nicknamed Teapot Domes of Wyoming, that area. Um, but this actually was a, a cartoon that you see on Star one year, and it was essentially a teapot, the oil scandal running over Harding um, all the way to the White House. It, this, this would define his legacy um, after he died. This And there's other, other, other issues um, that define his administration that um, were pretty bad. Um, other um, problems such as uh, one guy ended up taking all this money that was for hospitals, for veterans, and pocketing it millions. Like just keeping millions of dollars to go to construction for hospitals for veterans. So uh, Harding, after he dies, all these scandals come out. This is the most famous one. And Harding would be known um, as a pretty bad and corrupt president, um, but not until after he dies. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting um, how different he was seen before then. And here you have the headlines from President Harding dying. Um, there's a lot of suspicion his wife was behind this. Um, they're actually on a cruise on the coast of California. He starts to get sick. Um, he's sick for a few days, almost a week. Um, he starts doing better, and all of a sudden he gets sick again and dies. Uh, and, and the irony of this is that um, the symptoms he had very much matched poisoning. Um, and it was, in fact, true that his wife just found out he had been um, he had a mistress. Um, and we actually have those letters from his mistress. They discovered them just about, I think, like 10 years ago. And they're, they're pretty dirty. If, if you ever get a chance to Google it and read it, you'd be surprised people talk like that 100 years ago, especially the president. Um, very dirty. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we think she, uh, the, the conspiracy theory is that she found out about the, mis the mistress and poisoned him until he died. Uh, whether we know that or not, he does die. And his new VP is Calvin Coolidge. He was nicknamed Silent Cow. He's a laid-back guy. He's really relaxed. As a matter of fact, the story of him becoming president, he finds out he's actually at, at back in his hometown, small town, visiting his uh, father. Um, and he gets a telegraph that the president's dead. We need you in D.C. Um, he goes down. Um, he finds out about this. Talks to his dad. He goes back to the store, the convenience store at the, uh, in town. And it's uh, unlocked, which is what he did back then. He goes inside. He pulls a um, Coke out of the cooler. Puts a dime on the counter, walks to a telegraph machine, says he'll be there tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. He'll get sworn in tonight. Um, um, takes his coke and he leaves. Said he went to bed, slept fine, or got sworn in as president by his dad, who was an ordained minister or something like that. I can't remember exactly. Um, his dad swears him in. He uh, goes to bed, no problem. Wakes up, no problem. He's not stressed out or anything. Gets up to take a train. Says goodbye to his father. Um, and walks outside, trips over a rock, and says, that's a bad way to start this presidency, and just goes on to D.C. Um, this is Coolidge. Uh, weird, calm. Um, he's named Silent Cow or Cool Cow sometimes. Um, and that, that's just the way he is. He, he's very uh, relaxed and not very outgoing um, compared to other presidents. I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, he is known, you see, just from his demeanor, he is known for um, doing nothing, which we would think is a bad thing, but businesses love this. He carried on a tradition, that idea that you shouldn't interfere, the government should stay out of it. That's why he was chosen as VP. Um, um, specifically, he had said that uh, strikes are not allowed ever and never legal, and he told Samuel Gompers that at one point, the founder of AFL. Um, and, and so uh, that's why he was chosen. Um, Silent Cow also was a nickname. I'm supposed one time at a party, a woman sat next to him and said, uh, Mr. President, I told my friends, um, I bet them money that I could get you to say three words to me. He looks at her and says, you lose. And holds up two fingers and doesn't say another word to her. Um, that's a famous story that we have about the type of guy he was. He wasn't very talkative. People would come to the White House, and they used to do this back in the day, to complain or tell him problems. And he would let them in, 
he would wait outside to see him. He would go to my office, and they would go on and on and on. Sometimes for hours, just complaining and mad and upset. He would just nod his head yes and and go on about his way. And people would always look back and say, "What? Why, why didn't you say anything? Why didn't you do anything?" And he always had a point that some people just need to talk, and it's okay. And he would just listen. Um, but uh, he had that pro business approach and the anti government approach, anti government towards business. Um, government stays out of it. Many look back at this and say these policies by not stopping things when you could have led to over speculation in the stock market um, because at this point in time the 1920s there were no rules against the stock market um, they could do whatever they want even now we've seen these rules where like the sec will stop trading for a certain company if it gets too volatile it goes up and down all over the place they'll lock it up and say nobody can trade that, that stock's not being sold at all um, more recent times companies take the initiative to do that like robin hood that company did it but um, that's modern issues um, that we hear about quite often. Uh, cool, uh, Coolidge did win his set. He uh, finished that term, won his second term. Um, nothing really eventful, ha eventful happens. Um, business goes on as normal. Um, and Coolidge is going to see doesn't want to run again. Um, he's done. He's going to count that as two uh, terms, even though he just barely finished up Hardings. And after Coolidge will be another pro businessman. He's actually already a millionaire. Um, historians often look and say this guy is the first um, uh, businessman to become president. And it's ironic because he'll be the first um, to take us in what, or he'll be the one to take us into the Great Depression. Hoover was very similar to the first two guys, um, so it's not his fault that he's followed the same policies as Harding and as Coolidge. He's a third Republican that says, you know, he believes in this idea of rugged individualism. We need a system where everybody gets equal opportunity and free education and the will to succeed. We, you got to have that fight, that drive. He, he loves that. He says, government would destroy um, America, um, uh, government to restore the economies of America. It's going to take away that will to fight and keep going and push through it all. So when the depression happens, he does very little because he looks at this as government just makes it worse, not better. Okay, he will be known for the haughty smooth tariff. He'll pass the highest tariff in U.S. history, and everybody agrees that leads to the Great Depression. We place high tariffs on everybody else. Everybody puts high tariff on us. Now farmers really lose a lot of market, a lot of customers. Companies lose customers in other countries because we won't trade back and forth. Um, that's a surefire way to lead to a worldwide depression. It's when you stop global trade. Um, hindsight, common sense, we know that now. Um, but back then, um, certain economists knew this, and they actually do have petitions sent to him, but he still does it um, anyways. But now the prosperity in the 1920s, uh, that's in 1930, in 1930, he passes that tariff. In the 1920s, a lot of things did go right for America and the economy. Um, some of the reasons for that, um, Henry Ford introducing the Model T, it's the first affordable car. Um, it was affordable because he used this concept, and you can see from these pictures like here, it's called the assembly line, right? He uses this uh, process where um, one guy uh, will place the same tire on that car. He stands there. The car moves down a line, and it's assembled on this line. I, If I'm working on that line, I do the same thing nonstop. Because I'm doing the same thing, it moves faster than me putting on a tire, tightening the bolt, walking around, grabbing another tire, putting on the bolt. But if you had a guy just putting on a tire and it moves over and it hit and it bolted up and then it moves over and it put a door and then it moves over and it put the next door and then it moves over, like it's a lot faster. And you've seen this. Like if you can go to simply go to Subway, one person will get that bread, cut it open, put the meat on there, slide it down, and somebody does the veggies. When it gets really busy, you start doing you start seeing people separate and do the same task because it's more efficient. And that's what that assembly line was. It meant mass production, and anything that's produced uh, mass production is a lot cheaper. Like the Model T itself, once it goes in mass production, the average person of, an uh, average American employee, it would take 20 months to pay off the Model T. But once it gets into full production, uh, f f with a mass production with assembly line, it takes less than five months. Let me give you the number. So it's about $850 when it first starts in 1908, right? 850, right? Our modern times, that's like 17K. I looked this up because people would ask. Okay, 17K, $17,000. After Simulans implemented in 1916, I looked this up, this thing was like 360 bucks, right? That's the equivalent of $7,000 in modern times. The cheapest car now is $11,000.
So that's how a four-way became for the everyday person. And it's pretty interesting. Henry Ford has so many Model T's out there. They're all basic, the color black. Um, if you like look right here really close, you see this hand crank? Um, this is actually how they um, used to start the cars. So if you went to a parking lot and there are a whole bunch of black Model T Fords out there, because everybody put up to some event and you left early, you walked out there, you know which car was yours. People would walk up to any random car, crank start it, jump in and drive off. And nobody cared because they all were the same car. Um, never mind, like now we know nowadays how you treat the, the motor, transmission, how you drive makes a big effect, tires and stuff like that. But it was uncommon for people to grab the wrong car. I mean, I can just imagine how awesome that would be if you parked in the back and got to jump the first row of cars. Um, it's pretty crazy. But Henry Ford is known for that assembly line. Um, and it's a perfect example of, of uh, not only how a business can make it um, and make things more affordable um, and create jobs, but the assembly line, everybody will follow that through. Uh, the state test wants you to make sure, uh, and it's always puzzled me why they're so big on this. It is a new industry. Airplanes do take it to the next level. Um, uh, World War I is in uh, 1914, 1918, where planes really take off. Um, but as far as, as 1908, Glenn Curtis is known for the hydroplane, which was a plane that could land and take off on water. Um, and for uh, that is a pretty big reason, it's a pretty big step. I don't think it's, it's that significant, but the state of Texas feels it, it's. Uh, should be on your state test. But so it is another new industry we see, but motorcycles are a new industry as well. They don't really take off until after World War II, but there are lots of new industries that, that um, contribute to the roaring 20s and the economy um, blowing up. So as mass uh, production takes off, so does mass consumption. Americans become more and more materialistic. 1920 is the first year more people live in cities then in the countryside, we see the nation kind of divided. It's like 52% live in cities. Um, the rest live in the countryside. So if you live in the countryside, your last name meant a lot. What you did for a living meant a lot. But in the cities, we have so many people. You don't know people that well. You don't know people like that. Um, and so when you get these big cities, you people were judging each other by what they have or what they look like, what they were wearing, like we do in modern times. So it wasn't about your last name. It's how you looked and what you had. And so there becomes this this idea of mass consumption in America starts in the 1920s. Um, new programs exist at this point where you can um, have installment purchases. You pay for stuff in installments um, and you buy on credit. And if you look at some of these numbers, automobiles, 75% of them were actually bought on installment plan. Phonographs, uh, vacuum cleaners, furniture, washing machines, even jewelry. Like that's a lot of people buying on credit during that time period. And once they start buying more and more stuff on credit, it all adds up and eventually they can't afford these and it can come crashing down, right? Um, uh, and when you look at the actual prosperity, if you look at um, almost half the population had as much money, if you had all the money from 42% of the lower population of, the, of America, 0.1% of the highest owned the same amount. So those few people had as much money as almost half of Americans. So it's, there wasn't a real middle class here and everybody was buying on credit and it was just hurting them even worse, right? I'm taking a look, I'm gonna come back to this, but if you take a look, nobody could foresee what that would lead to. And then there was a speculation boom. Speculation is the idea that you buy cheap, sell high. We've seen people do this with cars in modern times. I've done it with vehicles. People do it with, used to do it with land. Or if you remember, go back to colonial times and the, uh, after the American Revolution, people did that with land. Banks did it, they bought lots of land and then waited and sold it for more. There's real estate Mongols that make a lot of money like that. In this case, we're talking about the stock market. Everybody thought they couldn't make money off the stock market back then, kind of like now, and people poured all their money into the stock market. As a matter of fact, this whole idea of buying on credit, if you apply that to stock market, it was called buying on margin, which is really key, because you had 10% and you could buy stock. So the rest was loaned by your stockbroker. But if the stock market crashed, your stock market called you and said, hey, I need the rest of the money you owe me for the stock. The stock crashed. You didn't have it. It was pretty bad um, for you and the stockbroker. Um, buying on margin is pretty key and important to know. You'll see this. Look, buy a vacuum cleaner. You pollute it down, $4 a month. You can buy all this stuff and easily sink into a lot of debt um, until you're over your head and not making it. Um, and that's what people did back then even more so than we see now.
social issues. This is when we see um, a rise in organized crime, crime, also called the mafia. You may have heard of these guys. Um, guys like Al Capone would not exist if it wasn't for the 18th Amendment, which if you guys remember is prohibition. Banning the sale of alcohol drinks already started with a temperance movement. Frances Willard was a woman that was well known for that. I mentioned to you guys Carrie A. Nation. She was hacking stuff up with her axe. Um, Star Test wants you to know about Frances Willard. She was a big leader. Um, she was a little less boring to talk about. But nonetheless, she is known for the temperance movement, which eventually will lead to the 18th Amendment, which is prohibition. Um, there were some states, there were two states that actually did not ratify this amendment. Um, and for a variety of reasons, people did this. Some people actually pinned it to immigrants, much like they do with uh, drug laws. And um, they're saying the German drunks, are drunks and the Irish are drunks. Um, we need these. Uh, we need prohibition to get rid of those immigrants and correct their behavior. Um, women did this because they thought it would help a woman's life. Uh, workers, the industry actually supported this in many cases because they thought alcohol slowed the production and the work uh, labor that men could do, um, coming in hungover and stuff like that. So there are a lot of different reasons why people supported it, um, and so it does get ratified um, by the states. Other people point out said this is your idea of more behavior forcing on somebody else. Um, and this was clearly an experiment and it was a huge failure. So many people refused to do this. And this is why we learn from prohibition. If people don't support a law, it will fail. Okay, that's what prohibition taught us. So much that in 1933, they get rid of prohibition. But you're saying, oh wait, it's an amendment. You just can't cross out amendment. You're right. You have to ratify another amendment to cancel out that amendment. It sounds funny, but when you think about it logically, if you want to make any change to the Constitution, you have to pass an amendment to amend the Constitution, right? So they passed an amendment that said, hey, the 18th Amendment doesn't count anymore. And so that is known as the 21st Amendment that repeals prohibition. A couple of terms, if you guys ever see these anywhere, a speakeasy with a secret bar in the 1920s. When you think of that, those cartoons where you knock on a door and then a slot opens up and the eyes say, what's the password? That comes from speakeasies. Um, people had secret bars still, even though it was illegal throughout the America, especially in big cities in the 1920s. And bootleggers are people who smuggled alcohol um, from Canada, sometimes Mexico. Um, Canada was always really big on that one. Um, you smuggle it into America, you, um, you keep it in different uh, stockpiles and different storage areas. Um, however, you could do it to get it in there. Um, and the mafia was really organized and well behind that. Um, and they were able to make a lot of money for that. Guys like Al Capone, that's why the mafia happens. It's because of alcohol. Uh, here you can see some agents busting up a speakeasy, right? Um, this as well, as they pour out alcohol. Right? Al Capone, uh, there you go. If you ever wonder what happened to him, he um, actually is finally arrested on taxes, by the way. They could only get him on taxes. Um, there's a really cool um, a clip called Untouchables. It's about these guys who went after Al Capone federal agents and they couldn't be bribed they couldn't be like bought out threatened or anything like that um it's an old school movie but um nonetheless they eventually get him on taxes and send him to um prison off the coast of cisco um and he actually gets released and when he's older he still has a lot of money left but um his bodyguards would say he um was pretty much like empty um he just stare off into space um because when he went to prison he had syphilis and it was slowly eating away at his brain. But other guys, like, uh, you probably heard of Machine Gun Kelly. That's after a uh, a, um, a gangster from the time, Pretty Boy Ricky. I think Ricky was his name. I know his nickname is Pretty Boy. Um, guys like that, um, Bonnie and Clyde. Um, I have here a picture of race cars because this is actually how NASCAR was born. Um, they needed, uh, when they're smuggling, bootlegging all of this alcohol like from Canada and these big trucks, they worried cops were going to pull them over. So they sent a car in front uh, of the trucks, just a couple miles in front of it, um, to lead the way and check for a policeman. Um, and eventually they would try, these cars in the front would lure the cops away and go chase after them. Um, they would speed by the cops so that the cops would pull them, would go out and pull them over, and so the trucks could go on by with no problems. Um, eventually, they would make those cars, those lead cars for those trucks. They make them faster, soup them up, and eventually that led to NASCAR racing because of prohibition and organized crime. It's pretty amazing. Um, there you have this last one. You see prohibition in the last, and everybody's happy. 
prohibition was so failed. Like there was, uh, there were ways to actually get it. You can do, you can get um, a wine kit, which was grapes and a box, and you could ferment your own wine at home. People do this today for a hobby, um, just like uh, beer and alcohol in general. Um, and people did it. Rednecks did this all over, like in the south. They had moonshine because it made it by the light of the moon, so they wouldn't get in trouble. That stuff was explosive, would destroy, um, would blow up. People did it in the bathtubs. Um, they had it out in the woods. It's very dangerous stuff. Heavy, heavily volatile. It, it is very, very dangerous. Um, moonshine actually existed at that point too. You could go to a doctor and get a prescription for alcohol. You know, I'm stressed out. I can't stand this anymore. And he would say, okay, at the end of the day, you need two pints of alcohol. Write your prescription and you take it to the pharmacy and they would give you alcohol um, as medicine. Um, sounds weird, but a lot of medicine actually starts as recreational drugs. Out gets outlawed and then they find a good use for it in the medical um, area. Socially, that's not all that's going on. What's really interesting, um, and it's one topic you have to know, is the Scopes Monkey Trial. Um, it's often called Scopes Trial, but I put the Monkey Trial just in case they show you any pictures, cartoons with monkeys. You know they're referring to this trial. Essentially, um, this trial actually it happened on purpose. Um, they were trying to fight this new law in Tennessee that said you can't teach evolution. Um, some lawyers wanted to overturn this law. In order to overturn this law, you have to be convicted of doing it and take it all the way up to the state Supreme Court. This whole process. So they went to this one guy named John Scopes and said, hey, we want you to, um, this, this biology teacher, we want you to preach evolution. You'll get arrested. We'll pay for it. We want to get, we want to overturn this law. John Scopes agreed to it. He goes and teaches uh, evolution, walks out to the classroom. He's arrested immediately. He's fined a hundred dollars for teaching evolution, essentially. And Dayton, Tennessee. Now this goes to court. Um, and when it goes to court, uh, it gets to be a national issue. This represents the traditional old school ways and the new modern values in America. Remember in the 1920s, half of America now live in cities, the other half traditional live in rural areas. This trial represents the new and the old, the conservative and liberal. Science versus conservative and many times religious viewpoints. Um, Scope's trial um, uh, to uh, defend uh, John Scope is Clarence Darrow. He's actually a famous defense attorney at the time. And the one man prosecuting in the Scope's trial, he'll volunteer his services. These guys, both guys are nationwide and they come to volunteer their services. Is a man you guys know as William Jennings Bryan. Name should sound familiar. You remember him from the Cross of Gold speech? I told you there's two things you guys need to know about him for star test. One was that cross a goat speech and how he got the progressives to vote Democrat. Um, he failed to win the presidency twice as a Democrat. But he does do pretty well here in John Scope's trial, volunteers to prosecute. Um, he actually says, this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this, even if this kills me, um, I'm going to win this and get him convicted. And he does die for a little bit shortly after this trial, ironically. But he's against the teaching of evolution. He's out to point out John Scopes. Um, uh, and this becomes a nationwide media frenzy. So big at one point, they're having the courtroom outside because there's just too many people, as you can see from this uh, photograph. Um, oddly enough, like this trial is pretty simple. Did you teach evolution? Yes or no? You did. Boom. You're guilty of the law. And then you go fight. the. You didn't say the law is unconstitutional. And you take it all the way up to six. Tennessee Supreme Court and stuff like that. You do that, right? But no, this they drug this trial out to make it a public like entertainment, essentially what it was, and it was. It's all over the media, everywhere, um, to a point where Clarence Darrow, the defense, will actually put Brian on the stand and um, interview him for as a witness, and he was telling him, "Oh, so you're a Bible expert, right?" He goes, "Yes, I'm a Christian, um, I'm a Bible expert," and so. Darrow asked him, well, how many days uh, did it take for uh, God to create earth or create everything? He like six and rested on a seventh. Um, he goes, well, he did that all in six days. That's pretty impressive. He goes, well, uh, Brian goes, well, it depends on what your definition of a day is. And so Darrow goes, oh, okay, so your definition of a day could be different than my definition of a day. Yes. So how can you teach the Bible if you have different interpretations of the Bible? It won't be the same thing. And it was like the big, aha, got you moment in the trial. But nonetheless, the trial wasn't about that. It was about, did you do it? Yes or no? And he did. That's why he ends up getting fined for 100 bucks. Darrow pays for it. It was just a publicity thing, really. But it, we look back at this and say, this does represent America, um, uh, the modern values at the time, and those traditional old schools that were seeping through. 
Um, so make sure you do know that uh, of this whole thing. And you have to know Jean, uh, William Jean Bryan is prosecuting on behalf of it. And it's an interesting court case that I feel like we would see the very same thing again today um, at some point. All right, so all that nativism that we talked about with immigrants, it really comes to a head with the Immigration Acts in 1921, 24, and 29, these Immigration Acts of the 20s. Um, before this, we talked about the only uh, immigration act that existed was a Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which was uh, a long time before this, 40 years before that. The Chinese are the only ones that actually had a law against uh, entering our country. But in the 20s, they take it to another level. Um, they have three separate ones. Uh, you don't have to know all three of them individually. You just really understand that they each created a quota. And a quota was a limited number of people. If I say I have a quota, to meet, I have to make a certain number. Like we often think cops have a quota and have to give a certain number of speeding tickets, right? In this case, a quota was a number, but it was a limit that said, okay, how many legal Germans are there in America right now? Oh, 100,000, okay. Well, only 3% can come in this year. Only 3% of 100,000. So they put a quota on a number of immigrants that can come over. And depending on where you're from, they had a different quota. So those from Southern and Eastern Europe, they had a much lower quota than somebody from England, right? Um, but uh, these actually technically were all European immigration quotas. None of them, we had not at this point even addressed Latin American immigration at all. Um, so um, I didn't have them until the Great Depression actually. Um, but these are the quota acts from the immigration acts of the 20s, um, important for you to know. Along with this idea of nativism is pretty crappy science. I mean, it sounds like what's happening today with people in anti-maskers. Um, but the, the idea it was back then was that a thing called eugenetics that would argue that human race could be improved by selective breeding. So here they would argue that how bad the Irish are. They would say they're horrible. And they would say something about uh, African-Americans. And this was a good one. This was a good one. These are bad. You didn't want this. So you could look at a person's profile and see exactly what race they were. Um, this is perfect. The other ones aren't. Um, and for a variety of reasons, not just from looks or anything like that, but um, even, t even really bad textbooks argue the size of brains. Um, and I've heard people say this when I was growing up. One guy told me the reason why um, black people were so fast because they had extra muscle in their leg. Like, dude, like, we're all not different species. We're all human. Like, that doesn't even make sense. But some people still believe that, like, 10 years ago. Um, so the idea of eugenetics, that some races were inferior, existed early as 1920s, and it was an excuse for immigration. So when we look at the 1930s in Germany, in 1930s in Germany, when Hitler takes power, and he's got that whole concept of one race is better than another one, and we're like, wow, that's crazy. Who could ever think that? It was a worldwide issue in the 20s. It was already over here um, in America. Um, and social Darwinism, you know that one too, was tied to it. Um, social Darwinism made this argument that um, you made it because of survival of the fittest. Right? You know Darwinism that says this species survived because its beak could break um, walnuts or nuts and could actually get to the seed and eat. Um, those with weaker beaks couldn't survive on this island but they survived in other islands because they had insects and stuff like that. So Darwinism was that idea of surviving, you're adapting, right? They made that argument to society itself, social Darwinism, and said, it's your fault you didn't survive, your, your race just can't do it, you're inferior. So it's, it's um, that whole concept of social Darwinism applied to society. Um, just like animals and plants, it's survival of the fittest. You can't make it, that's your fault. You probably have some inferior race in you. That's the way they saw social Darwinism. And you probably know some idiot that believes this stuff still today in 2021. Speaking of problems in uh, 2021 that we had 100 years ago was gender equality, right? Um, women do get the right to vote in 1919, right? And I do make this argument all the time. Once women get the right to vote, they are more confident. They are able to actually express themselves. Once you have that right to vote, that does that is a game changer. Because one thing you're going to realize is people will try to cater to you. Um, and and why what I mean that when you think about it, if I can't vote, is any politician ever going to do anything that might help me? Why would they? Because I can't vote for them. 
So they're not focused on helping me at all. So women are actually going to enjoy more and more once they get the right to vote. Um, and they're also going to be treated more like equals once they get the right to vote um, because they, again, they have the right to vote just like men. So they would be treated a little more like equals. Women aren't going to be more open to ideas. Um, part of this is a big argument is after World War One, everybody wants to party, right? That's, you've always heard that by the 1920s. Um, but also women do feel more liberated once they get the right to vote. And the women in the 1920s, um, not all of them, but many of them, we nicknamed flappers. They're going to wear the short skirts where you can actually see their knees. Calm down, gentlemen. Oh, tank tops, kind of, with a short... You can see their arms and especially their shoulders. The guys are going crazy. They will even wear swimsuits to the beach. Can you believe that? It's absolutely amazing. Short hair. They bob their hair short. Um, and they even wear makeup. Can you believe that they dared do all this stuff back then? I'm being sarcastic in case you can't tell. But they're called flappers. Not because of any of that. They're nicknamed flappers because it's funny, but the um, actual... A fad at the time was to leave your shoe unbuckled so the buckle would flap around a little bit. And so these women were nicknamed flappers of the 1920s. But that were women in the 1920s. And they did go to speakeasies. They did drink. They smoked in public. They were, I would say, liberated to do more than ever before. And if you're wondering if this was everywhere, it wasn't. By the way, um, you should look up pictures of women at Gallison Beach in like 1910. They actually had these stage coaches they would back up to the water the women would be in there they would change their swimsuits go straight to the water swim go back into that little stage coach um change back into their dresses and then walk around so this is very more of a big city area and when i say big city houston's not that big a city back 100 years ago like it is today in comparison to new york here you have some uh, more pictures of women who uh, smoke could drink could dance they were in those speakeasies um, they wore the makeup and they became actually Hollywood model, Hollywood stars at the time. Um, the new women, new morality was the viewpoint that people had of these um, of these young women in the 1920s. The music they danced to, probably two to one, came from an area called Tin Pin Alley in New York. Um, 90% of the popular music in the 1920s could trace back their originality to Tin Pin Alley. Um, this isn't necessarily... Uh, ja all jazz music. I do have your jazz music, blues, ragtime, dance music in general. Some people may have heard of Louis Armstrong, um, others that played piano, um, jazz singers, um, actual small bands and orchestras. Um, New York City, this area, Tin Pan Alley, lots of music came from. Um, and even writings as well. But Tin Pan Alley, strictly music, Harlem Renaissance is going to be a number of different things. Um, but I get, we'll get to that in a second. Here we have the youth and lost generation. Writers in 1920s were nicknamed the lost generation by actually European, a European writer. She actually looked at guys like Fitzgerald, Hemingway, Sinclair Lewis, and said, you guys, you're a lost generation. Writers now are a lost generation. You witnessed and saw war, and that's what you're stuck with in your mind. That's what you're thinking about, that you can't, whether you realize or not, consciously or subconsciously, um, that influences them. And so that's going to be a, a huge issue. And some of these guys did, Ernest Henry did write about Fair Road Arms and other guys did, wrote about wartime issues as well. Um, you might remember The Great Gatsby. Um, when he, uh, Fitz Scott Gerald wrote that, think about the movie you watch. He wrote it to prove a point. Like he made fun of all these wealthy people. Um, and no matter how much wealth the guy had in the end, it did not, it was not happier and better life at all. So these guys re rejected war, criticized 1920s consumerism, and the whole idea of everybody trying to be rich and the famous and the same. They made fun of it with these novels, um, and, and they hated the war and pointed out all the flaws of it. This was a lost generation, the writers of America in the 1920s. It's important here to talk about the Great Migration, and students often forget about migration is not immigration. You can migrate within a country. That's particularly the I. Um, and it's migration within a country. In this case, African Americans, many huge numbers, about two million of them, are going to leave the South. The dotted areas are, is the first, is the Great Migration, are going to move to the North to find work. Um, and you're going to see that in places like Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland. If you're ever wondering how we had so many African Americans in the South, 
when do we get these populations in the north and these bigger cities? This is that time period. When those men went off to World War II, or sorry, World War One, these guys were recruited to come up north, um, and they worked in those areas. As a matter of fact, look look up uh, Red Summer of 1919. You'll see race riots in these big cities because those guys came back looking for work, and they found African Americans that took their jobs. So we don't get into that for U.S. History Now Star Test, but it it does it is a scary, scary thing that happens um, in 19, uh, uh, 1919, summer 1919. But nonetheless, we talk about the Great Migration being African Americans heading to the north. It happens again during World War II. Um, these are during World War II, which we'll talk about later. But um, the North is the main one that we talk about when we talk about the Great Migration. And it is going to include places like New York, and specifically suburb areas such as Harlem and Upper New York City. All right, a couple hundred thousand Americans and African Americans are going to be there. And that leads to the Harlem Renaissance, which is a fascinating revival of African American culture. The reason why this is able to happen because in the South, you got to understand the history. African Americans had to keep their head down with those Jim Crow laws, with lynching, as bad as it was in the South. Your best part was just keep your head down and not disturb white people in general. But once these people can move, once people can move to neighborhoods with like minded individuals, they can express themselves. They can feel that way. Um, they can open up and explore their cultures and talk about it. And that's what we see with famous writers like Lynx and Hughes. They actually can write about black pride. Uh, technically, um, the, the phrase black power actually comes during this time period. Nobody, everybody always thinks it's like the civil rights. It actually dates back to the 1920s. That issue comes up. And artists as well, such as this. Um, you see lots of art from this Harlem Renaissance. is isn't just music. is isn't just jazz. No, no. It's literature, art um, as well. Mother's Son by Langston Hughes, one of my favorite poems. Uh, if you get a chance to actually just YouTube it and listen to it. Also, his um, one about a dream. Uh, a dream dies like a raisin if nobody uh, takes care of it. So Langston Hughes has a lot of good writings, um, and he's very famous, one of the most famous black authors of the Harlem Renaissance. Marcus Garvey was introduced for us to start teaching a few years ago, and he's a fascinating character. Um, he was a political activist, and he led a Back to America movement, this idea that African Americans can't exist in America. Um, and that we and that they need to um, return to the roots to um, Africa, specifically this idea of Liberia being a refuge for African Americans from the United States. Um, I point out these two pictures because if you look at most textbooks, especially a Texas textbook, they have crazy pictures of him like this in a purple uniform. It tells you a totally different story than a picture like this. Uh, Marcus Garvey was he was very charismatic, but uh, this picture makes him look goofy, especially with in color. Um, but he actually had a company where he took cruise ships, um, refitted them, um, and charged African Americans um, uh, tickets, the price, to take them back to African America where they could start life again in uh, Liberia. Um, and he always had this famous saying, and I think it's really great, a people without the knowledge of their past or origin and culture, it's like a tree without roots. Think about a tree without roots, not going to stand up very well too much, is it? Um, so he was big on that. But in the end, you don't have to know this for Star Test, but he gets thrown in jail for taxes, of all things. All right, so Marcus Garvey can be a hero for some people. The state of Texas doesn't get a lot into him, but they do ask questions about him. You got to know that. Um, but other new heroes of the time, you guys may have heard of some of these guys. Babe Ruth of the Yankees, which I don't know what to think about him. Supposedly he could he'd eat like 26 hot dogs before a game. Um, people always make fun of Barry Bonds because they're like, you just still worried Babe Ruth hot dogs but to be honest back then it was different he actually also was a pitcher he pitched in the longest game it was 26 innings but back then it was different you didn't have pass balls going 98 miles an hour or over 100 at you things were different back then bats were heavier to be honest um guys like ryan dempsey of boxing um uh, boxers sports heroes sports guys became heroes for the first time um, ever and they became nationwide known. The most famous uh, sports guy I think was actually Lou Gehrig, but I won't get into him in this. In this, you should look him up. Um, he has a fa pretty famous saying: and "Dies way too young." Horrible uh, story about a guy who was once great. But for us, for Star Test, they really want you to understand Charles Lindbergh, how important he was. Most people know him about the Lindbergh baby, um, but that's years later. At this point in time, in 1927, he's going to make history. He'll be the first person to fly by themselves, fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean all the way to Europe. 
keep in mind the progress of airplanes at the time. Um, we had barely in World War I, 1914, and really not towards, until towards 1918, the end of the war, where planes were really reliable um, and got better and better. He would take one by himself and fly for 33 hours. He stays awake in a nonstop flight from one continent to another one and sets the record for being the first pilot to do that. And he becomes a national hero after that. Um, ben, of course, he just had a tragedy turn, uh, but that's a whole other story, um, not for this class. And that's going to wrap up. Again, I have these questions at the um, 1920s. Next, we'll talk about the dirty 30s and the Great Depression and the New Deal. The end um, for you guys to practice on, but that pretty much wraps up our uh, 